Welcome back to Rod Reacts. Rod Reacts everything to India. And we're going to react to India history of science. So let's see what they contribute, contributed back in the day um, with a history of science. So we're going to check this out. We're going to increase our knowledge. Hopefully uh, you're increasing your knowledge with me. Um, if you disagree with something in the video, maybe they got something right or wrong, I don't know. Let me know down below in the comment section. For now, let's check it out. Let's see what it's all about. Let's do this. You might have recognized some of the names of the Greek natural philosophers. They were individuals with quirky theories, and we have records about them. But they weren't the only people making knowledge back in the day. Right. India had major urban centers, centralized administrative states, and complicated metaphysical traditions long before the Greeks had anything Ooh. big. Just goats, which are small, and olive <laughs> trees, which are bigger than goats, but still small. And a few gods and goddesses doing normal stuff like cheating on each other. In Indian scriptures, thousands of gods and demons made perpetual war, destroying and recreating reality itself. Ancient Indian thinkers didn't give rise to the same natural philosophy as the Greeks. India presents a convenient counterpoint to Greece because knowledge making in India was inseparable from a long religious tradition sponsored by the state and focused on applications. At the same time, both regions exchanged ideas with each other and right. with the wider world. Today, we'll dive into to a couple of major aspects of Indian natural philosophy, underlying philosophy, philosophy, and math. Ah, and we will talk about everyone's favorite large mammal, the elephant. All right, let's do this, I'm excited. He's gonna dig deep. Ancient India was home to several schools of thought, including what would become Hinduism, its more austere rivals Buddhism and Jainism, and a super fatalistic faith called Ajayvika that isn't around anymore. The most I've never heard of Aj Ajayvika. I've never heard of that. Important Hindu texts were the Vedas. The word Veda Vedas. literally means knowledge. Right. These sacred texts are passed along orally, even today, but they had also been written down for centuries by the time Alexander the Great invaded Western India in 326 BCE. Science he invaded it, but he didn't get in it, really. He got pushed back, so I, I like that part of the history and religion were entangled in both Greece and India. True, the Greek natural philosophers began to break with a mythological tradition, or at least repurposed it, proposing new ways of thinking about nature. Even so, we could never neatly separate out science from religion. They mutually affect one another. In India, right. knowledge systems were essentially well, Vedic. The Vedas were written in a sacred language, Sanskrit, which was standardized around the time of the first Greek natural philosophers. The greatest Sanskrit scholar, Panini, wrote a book on grammar listing almost 4,000 rules. These covered finet- 4,000 rules? Panini, that's a lot of rules, buddy. Meter, semantics, etymology, everything about the language and how it should be used. In fact, Panini's theory of how words are formed was so advanced that it was directly studied into the 20th century. So wow. you can say that the first science in India was linguistics. Yes. And this tradition of memorizing the Vedas and trying to understand words eventually led to the study of acoustics and musical tones. But is studying language, which is a very human thing, the same kind of knowledge making as studying fire or grass? Gravity? Yes! Totally. Linguists make hypotheses, take careful observations, and put together testable theories about how languages change. Right. They might be frustrated by the seeming randomness of their subjects, but then again, so are quantum physicists and medical doctors. Some parts of the Vedas concerned math and astronomy, but mostly they concerned gods and rituals. Right. The Vedas taught that the cosmos is clearly ordered, as is human society. What happens in the reality you perceive is the result of a complicated ethical algorithm running in the background, so you have to sacrifice a lot of animals and stay in your social position. Thus, the Vedas functioned not only as a basis for a whole language, but as a way of teaching people how a society should be, a mirror of an orderly cosmos. And so we arrive here at the present year 321 BCE. It's not actually 321, but it was. Right. At one point. At that time, in Greece, Aristotle had been dead for only one year. Over in Babylon, in what is now Iraq, Aristotle's former boss, Alexander the Great, had been dead for two years. Right. But in eastern India, a young adventurer named Chandragupta Maurya was very much alive. That year, he became emperor of nearly the entire subcontinent. Alexander had... Which is pretty impressive. Emperor of the entire subcontinent. 
Only recently invaded India, wisely choosing not to start a beef with the powerful kingdom of Magadha. When Alexander died, India consisted of a lot of small kingdoms. Maria, inspired by the model of Alexander and coached by a brilliant older advisor, led a coup in Magadha. From there, Maria conquered the weaker kingdoms one by one, forging them into a giant powerful state called, wait for it, what name? Uh, did he name it? Who knows? It's the Maurya Empire. Empire. The yeah. dynasty that Maurya founded lasted from 322 to 180 BCE. It sponsored research into astronomy, hydraulic engineering, and forestry. Chandragupta's grandson, Ashoka, Ashoka yes. became one of the most powerful and culturally influential rulers of India, as well as a serious convert to Buddhism. He I, love, I love Ashoka. I love Ashoka's story. I've done a reaction on Ashoka. You should go check it out. But he was very brutal. And then he had a change of heart. It's just a very good story. Not just a story, it's a very good history. He outlawed hunting and other unnecessary acts of violence toward animals, and opened public hospitals and spread Buddhism as far as Athens. When the Buddhist monk Fakshian visited India from Jin Dynasty China starting in 399 CE, he favorably compared the two empires. Both were civilized societies where Buddhism could flourish. Increased travel between states brought increased trade in goods as well as ideas. Right. Under the Congress. Maurya Empire, more than half of the arable land in ancient India was irrigated producing two harvests a year. That sustained a lot of people and required a lot of planning. Thus, Indian states developed whole government departments to supervise the building and maintenance of irrigation systems. So they basically they were engineers. Controlled a vast system of canals and sluices funded by taxes. Breaching a dam was punishable by death. Ooh. The centralized Maurya Empire, like the Egyptian, Sumerian, and Chinese ones, was a hydraulic state. Its control of water allowed harvests stability, keeping large populations alive. To control nature, the people running these big states needed to know lots of things about the lands, plants, animals, and especially rivers they controlled, and most especially about the people who owed them taxes. First rule of history, <laughs> right. nobody ever, ever liked paying taxes. Never. Another key to running a big state in India was the elephant. Training hundreds of war elephants was important to continued military power, so the Maurya created a forestry department because elephants lived in the forests and made the slaying of elephants punishable by, you guessed it, death. death. Forestry management and regulating land and water would eventually develop into sciences in their own right. The Maurya's administrative or useful science, such as their pioneering work in land management, was not the same as the abstract theorizing of the Greek natural philosophers. The Greeks left behind their names, thanks to their writings and their cults, I mean, I mean their schools. The work of those <laughs> who maintained early hydraulic states tended to be anonymous. A debate about the relative merits of applied versus pure science, knowledge of the immediately useful versus the abstractly true, is still raging today. Just compare a scientist applying for a grant to study, say, lichen versus as an engineer working on computer guidance for missiles. But useful and abstract systems are not diametric opposites, and they were never fully separate. India had been open to Persian and Chinese influences before Alexander. The Chinese had already introduced alchemy, or systematic questioning about what is stuff, to Indian thought. But India definitely became more Greekish when a bunch of Greeks, some trained by Aristotle himself, pranced in talking about elements and perfectly circular star paths. Astronomy was important to all all of the ancient states. Absolutely. This is because alongside their war making and tax taking, states were also religious institutes which cared about astrological schedules. Because if you're a god, you can fly around the heavens, you have houses in different parts of the sky, and you want to be worshipped when you're in the right house. In India, as all over the ancient world. And it's weird, you know, some of the temples on the roofs, they have crosses and stuff. Um, they're pointed in certain directions perfectly, so a lot of science into that. So where did that come in? Who did these things? Religion and science were not separate ideas in the way that we might think of them today. Practicing astrology meant carefully observing stars and planets, and thus also practicing astronomy. People who knew a lot about the night sky made up a high-status professional class. These stargazers were part priest, part astronomer, and part mathematician. As astronomers, they divided the solar year into months, crafting calendars to regulate religious ceremonies. They developed a calculation for adding a leap month when necessary to 
keep the religious calendar in sync with the solar <laughs> one, right. and they investigated the moon's cycles as well as constellations. As mathematicians, they came up with names for very large numbers, such as 10 to the 40th, related to the very long cosmic cycles in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. In fact, astronomy and related math really took off in ancient India. But let's take a closer look with the thought bubble. During the Gupta Empire, which lasted from 319 to 605 CE, families of professional astronomer mathematicians passed down their teachings about the stars, and they competed with each other. Six regional schools of thought all fought for state patronage. This period also saw the rise of the Siddhantas, or the Solutions, meaning high-level astronomy textbooks. So to basically they had a science mathematics war, which increased everybody's knowledge. Pretty cool. Two of the major Siddhanta writers were Aryabhata and Brahmagupta. Brahma they were Gupta. both brilliant polymaths, but unfortunately they disagreed about astronomy. Which was really too bad, because these guys would have made a team of unbeatable geniuses. Right. Written around 500 CE, Aryabhata's Book of Solutions includes a place-value system decimal notation, the familiar numbers that we call Arabic today, the number zero and the irrational number pi calculated to four places. Wow. And Aryabhata famously that. posited that the Earth rotates daily on its axis. This idea was a major breakthrough in astronomy. Egyptian, Greek, and earlier Indian thinkers argued that the sky rotates around the Earth. Aryabhata figured that the apparent movement of the stars is actually caused by the rotation of the Earth itself. Oh, wow. But Brahmagupta thought a rotating Earth defied common sense. Just look at all the birds not flying off into the heavens. Meanwhile, in his own Siddhanta, Brahmagupta calculated the circumference of the Earth with a astonishing precision, and he worked with negative and irrational numbers. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Indian mathematicians were working on Smart. many topics that writers in Greece were not. But the most advanced branch of natural philosophy in ancient India was more founded in Vedic teachings. Ayurveda, literally life knowledge, or the science of life, began with oral traditions about sacrificial animals. By the 6th century BCE, it was a standardized system of medicine and a way of answering the question Question, what is life? Ayurvedic approaches Hard to diseases and sometimes. cures were rational. There were reasons for every choice. Good physicians didn't believe in strictly divine cures, but practiced medical judgment based on years of study and then more years of experience. The influential medical textbook Sharaka Samhita, for example, calls for physicians to apprentice with a master, then get royal permission to treat patients. It also lists 300 bones, 500 muscles, 210 joints, and 70 vessels within the human body. This was written sometime before 200 CE, and today's med school students complain about organic chemistry. <laughs> Ayurveda, which is still around today, is so complex and important that we're devoting another episode to it alongside ancient European medicine. For now, just note that Indian medicine and surgery was probably the most advanced of any contemporary ancient civilization. That's amazing. Which, in people and faiths, India was not a single culture even under the highly successful Maryas and Guptas, but certain features of ancient Indian natural philosophy stand out. The ancient Vedas, literally the knowledges, influenced a wide variety of thinkers across a large geographic region. There were no sharp breaks with Vedic ways of knowing, although Buddhism and influences from China and Greece added new layers of philosophy on top of the Vedic one. And the Maurya and Gupta states were wealthy and well-administered, known for their skilled artisans and able to control vast plains in order to feed teeming cities. As ancient states exchanged goods and proto-scientific ideas, Indian ideas spread far and wide. We have accounts of Ayurvedic physicians, or Vedya, working in 8th century Baghdad, then one of the largest cities on earth and a center of knowledge production. Next time we'll travel to the Americas to ask questions like, when are we? That was an amazing video. That was a video that increased my knowledge tenfold about ancient sciences of uh, India. A um, lot to do with the moon, the stars, the space, medicine, surgery, um, animals taking care of them, uh, engineering, the list goes on and on and on, numbers, calendars. India played a huge part. A lot of smart, brilliant people that's not really well known today um, came out of India, came from India, and has influenced each and every one of our lives, no matter where you live in the world.
No matter where you live in the world, unless you're some tribe out in the Amazon that's never actually spoke to outside world, you know, of their village, they have influenced us. So that was an amazing video. I increased my knowledge tenfold. Thank you. Uh, just go check out Crash Course. Very good channel. But those are my thoughts, feelings. It's just amazing what came out of India, and I had no idea, and maybe you didn't either, or a lot of people don't know. So it's important. It's important to know where things came from so we can learn. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Those are my feelings. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Check. Um, if you have any comments to let me know, anything to add about this, comment down below. Let me know what I should react to next, and uh, I'll see you next time. Spread that peace, love, happiness. I'll see ya.